We've come a long way, baby. Welcome to Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle, your show for compassionate living without sacrifice. In honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, on this episode of Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle, I'd like to share with you my experience with breast cancer, how I navigated diagnosis, treatment, healing, and making positive changes all as a vegan. Plus, I'm joined by a special guest, Dr. Christy Funk, renowned celebrity breast cancer surgeon and most sought after TV expert on breast health, who is also a vegan right here on Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle. When non-vegans think vegan, often their first thought is whether a vegan is healthy, and mostly without considering their own non-vegan health and overall repercussions of not being vegan. Veganism is not exactly about human health, it's about equal respect for all species and thus not consuming them in any way. But good or optimal health can be what I call a positive collateral of being vegan. They're all different kinds of vegans, but the one common denominator is living with compassion for all sentient and some allegedly non-sentient beings to care for the animals, our planet, and thus, yes, for humans. As you may know from previous episodes of this show, from Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle live streams and from LVL social media, I've always considered myself a healthy vegan, eating mainly whole foods. But I very much enjoy bringing you innovations in food, cosmetics, fashion, home, and all aspects of vegan living. So you have seen me eating processed foods, and I love that they're available to us, all in the name of the animals. On October 21st, 2021, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And one year later, oh, I'm gonna cry. I'm feeling healthier and in better shape than I have in at least a decade. I've had to learn and relearn in order to make changes in my lifestyle and form new habits, because I'll be damned if I don't do all I can to keep cancer away forever. And I wanna share them with you. Stay tuned to join me and my special guest, to find out all about it. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month and I'm joined by special guest, Dr. Christy Funk. Dr. Funk is a board certified breast cancer surgeon, best-selling author, and co-founder of the Pink Lotus Breast Center. She is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons, as well as the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Her book, Breasts, The Owner's Manual, Every Woman's Guide to Reducing Cancer Risk, Making Treatment Choices, and Optimizing Outcomes is a national bestseller available in 10 languages and in over 30 countries. Known for her surgical treatment of celebrities such as Angelina Jolie and Sheryl Crow and her advocacy of whole food, plant-based nutrition, Dr. Funk is the go-to breast health expert for Good Morning America and The Doctors and has appeared on The View, Today, CNN, Rachel Ray, Extra, Access Hollywood, and innumerable other TV programs and publications. She joins me now here on Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle. Dr. Funk, thank you so much for making the time to join us here on Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to discuss your breast cancer journey with you and to educate others about what they can do to reduce cancer risk or recurrence risk. So thank you for having me. Um, as we know, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month and a year since my own diagnosis of breast cancer. So I wanted to utilize this space and my experience to help bring awareness, to let people know that they're not alone. They don't have to navigate this by themselves and also share with people ways in which they can care for their breasts and not be caught by surprise as I was as a near lifelong healthy vegan. Let's start with what are some of the misconceptions about breast cancer? I think the biggest misconception is that, oh, you know what? It doesn't run in my family, so I'm not really at risk for that. Mm -hmm. Like high blood pressure runs in the family and that nothing could be further from the truth. Only five to 10% of all breast cancer comes from inherited genetic mutations like BRCA, CHECK2, PALB2. 
So the vast majority of women with breast cancer, 90 to 95%, A, don't have a gene mutation, and B, only 13% of them with breast cancer have a single first degree relative with breast cancer. So it turns out that we have a lot more control over this disease than we probably have been led to believe, but we're also much more at risk just by being women and getting older. The one in eight chance of getting breast cancer applies to everyone, 12.5% when you do all the one ins decade after decade, a lifelong risk is at least one in eight. And it goes upwards from there, depending on your lifestyle and dietary choices, as well as other somewhat uncontrollable factors um, in terms of like environmental toxicities, although we can be aware of endocrine disruptors and minimize their impact on our lives. So there's a lot to consider when it comes to why someone can get breast cancer. And I think the most important misconception is that genetics, while truly important, and if you have a gene mutation, is a big deal that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But for the vast majority, it's not inherited gene mutations. It's the choices you make every single day. And that's actually empowering, I think. Yeah, it absolutely is. You know, when I when I was diagnosed, I was like, huh, interesting. Why would I have gotten it? And there are a lot of factors. I started smoking when I was a kid, when I was 12, smoking cigarettes. And I didn't quit mm. until about maybe 10 years ago. When you introduced yourself just now, I'm like, why did Lucia get breast cancer? You are kind of that outlier at the end of my bell curve. So you've got the five to 10% inherited genetic mutations and maybe 5% are people like you where I'm like, hmm, they seem to have done everything right since birth. Like they're not overweight, they eat vegan, they exercise constantly, they don't drink excessive alcohol, like why? But smoking actually has been very tied to breast cancer, particularly when people smoke in their youth and heavily prior to the first pregnancy. So that's interesting to me. That is like the one connection smoking otherwise is not super tied into breast cancer, except in that scenario. Wow. And I keep forgetting because I quit so long ago and I never do, you know, anniversaries. I didn't want to like, I didn't want to mark it. So I have no idea what day or what year I quit just about, you know, approximate. And I keep forgetting because I am otherwise, aside from that, I've always been healthy. I was raised eating mainly vegetables um, and, um, you know, healthy vegan. The healthy vegan is quite a conundrum for me as to why, but there are forces at play that are sometimes just truly unrecognized. And I think emotional stress for many people sets the stage of chronic, maybe low level, but persistent inflammation. And we see that in markers we can evaluate, C-reactive protein, interleukins, et cetera. So that mind-body connection is obviously very real. And I think that time after time, that can create the tumor microenvironment, sort of the factors that our cells bathe in. It can add so much inflammation to that microenvironment that just takes one unlucky mutation in your breast cell for it to have this window to escape through and propagate into an actual cancer. That makes so much sense to me because reflecting, I was like, why again, why? Aside from the smoking, why? And that makes so much sense. Your book, you've written a national bestseller that's available in 10 languages in 30 <laughs> countries. Um, it is. I love the title, Breasts, the Owner's Manual, Every Woman's Guide to Reducing Cancer Risk, Making Treatment Choices, and Optimizing Outcomes. What are some of the top things people should consider about a vegan lifestyle in regard to reducing cancer risk and, recover and recurrence, as well as in recovery? The top thing to consider is whether your food is truly whole food plant-based, right? We know about the unhealthy vegan choices out there, but for people who are just transitioning to plant-based eating, they can be kind of a source of comfort and a reminder of things that they're really missing. And I'd rather you do occasionally snack on um, like chips and hummus instead of fresh vegetables and hummus, if that's going to stop you from having like a hamburger today. Mm -hmm. But um, in general, people you ask what mistakes they can make when they're transitioning to the vegan lifestyle, an overdose of, you know, processed meats and foods, particularly like burgers and the sausages, the 
jelly slices that are all, you know, plant-based, but they're laden with salt and oil and other foods have so much sugar and really hidden trans fats even because like these hydrogenated vegetable oils are truly trans fats, very inflammatory inside your system. So you want to always examine your plate and kind of be honest with yourself about how much of this came from a package and how much was just straight out cooked up from fruits, vegetables, legumes, right? Lentils, beans, peas, seeds, nuts, and whole grains. The other thing is to start reading labels. We get really tricked by marketing opportunities on the front. They'll say like 10 grams of whole grains. And then you turn over this package and you see the first word is enriched wheat flour. Well, it's already going to <laughs> yeah. be so highly processed that you absorb the nutrients very quickly into your bloodstream elevating sugar which elevates insulin and that therein is the main problem with these highly processed foods is that it rapidly gets absorbed elevating growth hormones particularly insulin is a direct breast cancer initiator mm -hmm. and it helps it grow and metastasize and it lowers the binding protein for igf1 insulin like growth factor one which is the largest loudest growth promoter inside our body so insulin being high because you were eating too many processed sugary foods not to even mention i'm kind of vilifying just the processed meats but we've got chips and cookies and cake and crackers and oreos and ice cream and beer and all these foods that are definitely vegan and definitely unhealthy mm -hmm. and once that binding protein lowers igf1 elevates and it starts screaming at things to grow you grow arterial plaque you grow fat you grow a cancer cell you grow a cancer metastatic cell so we have to be very mindful about how we're eating and look at that plate and and realize that if there's too many processed things on it we're not doing our body a, we're not doing right by our bodies exactly exactly and you know if we you know i i i don't i don't you know let's say blame the the not the unhealthy vegans or the junk food vegans as they call themselves because their main you know the main purpose of veganism is to is for the animals but i always think why would you want to care for someone else, any other sentient being, and not also care for yourself? <laughs> so, I know, uh, I, right? <laughs> and I think it's a, a, a lack of understanding that they actually are harming themselves. There was a recent study published just in the summer of 2022, followed uh, 65,000 women for 12 years, and they found they were all plant-based, but they found that those following an unhealthy plant-based diet we're 20% more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer than those following a healthy plant-based diet. So even amongst those of us fighting the good fight to uh, save animals and the planet, um, we can make choices that are harming ourselves at the same time. Yeah. What I like people to really understand is that every time you chew and swallow a food, it becomes a chemical inside your bloodstream that's traveling around and working for you or against you. So every time you lift fork to mouth, you are moving yourself toward cancer or farther away. Every time you think or don't think something, every time you drink or don't drink something, every time you move or don't move, you are making choices that are either leading to a pro-cancer environment inside of you or an anti-cancer one. So I wanna help you understand that every action throughout your day is making a cellular impact and you want it to be working always for you and never against you. When you chew and swallow, what that food does alters very critical factors inside of you, namely estrogen, so 80% of all breast cancers are fed and fueled by estrogen. So an abnormal excess is detrimental to your health. Mm -hmm. Eating animal protein and animal fat will elevate IGF-1, which we just talked a bit about being a huge growth promoter. It's so critical to the promotion and existence of cancer that there are these people, mainly in Ecuador, they have Laron syndrome, they can't process IGF-1. And no one in the history of the world with Laron syndrome has ever had breast cancer. In fact, no cancer. There was just one ovarian cancer, 2017, stage one, and she's fine. Mm -hmm. So you need IGF-1 to form cancer. Eating animal protein and animal fat will also create angiogenesis, angio blood vessel genesis birth. If a cancer aspires to be bigger than the tip of a ballpoint pen, it must create its own blood supply. And it accomplishes this. 
and it's aided to do this by the reaction inside of you to eating animal protein and animal fat. Like VEGF, for example, is um, a, something that elevates and that lays the little tracks down for the arterial inflow to a cancer. But you choose the opposite. You eat plants and they lower your estrogen, lower IGF-1, increase the binding protein body snatcher for IGF-1 and literally squelch away that angiogenesis, takes away the blood vessels that the cancer needed so badly. So ultimately this all cascades into inflammation, oxidative stress, free radical damage, and then DNA mutations that an impaired immune system being hampered all day long by bad choices can't do anything about. So the cancer is just left unchecked to its own devices. It's amazing to think of it this way because, you know, people, I, I, there's this, that saying, get in my belly. And I'm like, no, it's not get in your, well, kind of, but you want to <laughs> get on your taste buds, right? Because once it's in your belly, it's doing something mm -hmm. else. So I love the way you right. explain this because it really drives home that food is not just something we taste. It actually has a huge impact on everything. It does. And there's so much scientific research that's poured into understanding what these chemicals are. It sounds like a negative word chemical, but you know, plant-based nutrients are phytochemicals and they have so much power inside of our bodies that it becomes very fun to eat it's like a food laboratory <laughs> Every time you go into the kitchen like do i need a little more antioxidant today because you know i maybe had two glasses of alcohol yesterday so i'm going to combat that today with more berries <laughs> yeah that you know i guess because i was i i lucked out and having parents who really focused on fresh foods and veggies. The focus was always mainly on fresh vegetables, fresh vegetables, fresh vegetables, nuts, grains, like everything, you know, healthy, natural. So it was very easy for me to, to be vegan. Um, mm -hmm. and to, I love, yesterday I had two enormous carrots for dinner, some edamame, mm -hmm. miso soup. And I was like, I was so happy, so happy. <laughs> Because the, the, the taste of things that come from our earth, it's a whole different story. There, you know, it does something to the taste buds and to your entire body, right? There, there are um, chemicals that are released from foods that do hit like dopamine receptors yeah. and your happy receptors that mm -hmm. say, hmm, I want some more of that. So, <laughs> but those same taste buds are, you know, often more often than not hijacked by the food industry with salt and oil and sugar and things that are even more addictive and more powerful at the opioid receptors in our brain. For example, milk, cheese. You take the cheese and it's 80% protein of a protein called casein. And mm -hmm. when casein hits your stomach, it becomes casomorphin. And just like that sounds, it hits the morphine receptor in your brain. It only has one tenth the signaling capacity or thereabouts of like heroin, but bam, straight to your brain, give me more of that. And that's why people usually have more than one slice of pizza. <laughs> oh, your extensive research into nutritional science led you and your family to become vegan. It did, yes. <laughs> so that was an interesting uh, moment. And it was literally a moment. So I've been writing Breast the Owner's Manual, the book you mentioned, mm -hmm. and I did a deep dive into nutritional science really for the first time in my entire medical career. Mm -hmm. So here I was at the time now 18 years into my medical practice. And for the first time, I'm uncovering all of these scientific truths from very reputable journals, The Lancet, JAMA, New England Journal. These are not like, you know, Green Leafy Magazine. This is peer reviewed journals over and over and over again, showing how detrimental eating animal protein and animal fat is. While at the same time, eating plants does the exact opposite. So it's not just that you need to avoid this, it's that what you eat to avoid it, being plant-based, mm -hmm. is so phenomenally full of health, so much power in the food to not only stave off a possible breast cancer, but almost any cancer in our bodies. And then all of our killers, right? Heart disease, stroke, diabetes, Alzheimer's, obesity, and then things that they don't have to like show up and kill you, but they can just steal you of your joy and zest for life, like irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, um, 
chronic joint pain, depression, anxiety, even acne, like one good zit on the tip of your nose can ruin a whole week, right? So <laughs> we find that eating plant-based just really blankets our whole life in this like cozy warmth of health and wonderful attitudes. And you have cleaner skin and cleaner lungs and healthier, stronger bones. And it really just goes on and on. So at some point I was I had enough of this obvious um, villainry of the animal industry and the in the gloriousness of plants that uh, there was a particular day and um, it's it's true. So it's just crazy that it went down like this. When I was writing the book, I would write for about 15 hours a day, every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And the other 40 days I had to work. And so people were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you wrote this whole book. And like, you have so much going on with your pride. I was like, I didn't parent. Um, that's how I did it. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> had to be ignored. So it was the kids. And at the time, um, so I have with Andy, we have, he always hates it when I'm like, I, my kids. He's like, uh, okay. So we have triplet sons. And at the time they had just turned eight, like four days before this magnificent day where they were going to camp and I'm all like oh I'm gonna parent for 10 seconds so I run downstairs I'm like I'm gonna make your lunch for camp so embarrassing I literally took organic um that's my I think I'm saving myself by saying that organic chicken breast turkey breast right sliced turkey breast from the deli took it a, put a mozzarella stick and rolled it up like a cigarette and then rolled all of that in lettuce because I was a product of the 1980s and bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes made you fat. So I was like any loving mother passing on my carb fear to my boys mm -hmm. and giving them a sandwich without bread. <laughs> and I put this in their little lunch boxes with some fruits and who knows what else. And off they went. I go upstairs to continue writing. And the very next thing I read, this is a true story, was the IARC 2015 ruling answering the question, hey, does red meat or processed meat cause cancer. So the IARC, if you don't know, is part of the World Health Organization. So they're not bought by anyone. They really just look at the facts and they report to us humans what does and does not in fact cause cancer. So they pour over 800 epidemiologic studies. There were 22 researchers from 10 different countries and they emerged from this deep dive to say, all processed meat definitely causes cancer. It is a group one carcinogen with the same certainty that tobacco and asbestos and plutonium cause cancer. All processed meat causes cancer and red meat probably causes cancer. Okay. Again, truth unveiling. I'm like, processed meat. Like I know sausage and salami, like that's got to be disgusting and it's processed, but, but uh, is that turkey slice? I just gave my kids processed. Is that process? Like I didn't even, I wasn't even sure. I was just hoping it wasn't, but of course it is. All deli meat is processed. So I basically was like, I'm done. I went downstairs and I said, Hey Andy, can we just go vegan? And he was like, oh, yes, I've never eaten this badly until I met you. <laughs> I was like, I get that because it's true because I was queen of the cheese platter. He never had cheese before he met me. And then I also introduced turkey slices to him. He was born and raised in Germany. And he also, like you, had a very whole uh, holistic mother and lots of fruits and veggies. He ate well and then met me. So I, in my defense, I didn't eat any uh, meat at all between the ages of 10 and 30. Wow. And I never had red meat. But anyway, the point is, wow. he was on board. So I go back upstairs. I'm like, okay. Then I hear the boys come home from camp and I'm like, oh, thank the Lord they're alive. And so <laughs> I fling open the refrigerator doors with great panache and I say, boys, we're going vegan. And they were like, yeah, what is vegan? <laughs> and I cleaned out with their help the entire fridge from every single animal product, you'd find it in sneaky places in that freezer with our organic veggie patties. Oh, there's milk in there. Oh, there's cheese in that. And we filled four grocery bags to the brim. And that was going on six years ago. We've never looked back in a day, just done. Great, great. It's interesting because, you know, I've, I've spoken with other plant-based doctors. Even in medicine, there's such still conventional thinking. I always wonder what happened to let food be thy medicine, right? because with all the conventional mm -hmm. training now, now I guess for decades, um, it's great that we're coming, let's say back to 
you know, foods, even supplementing medicines and, and um, treatments to help us heal and help us remain healthy. It's definitely a terrific thing to see that lifestyle medicine has its own certification and that doctors are coming around to understand that food is so powerful as a nutrition source. Okay. And so are the behaviors that we choose and particularly about exercise and weight mm -hmm. and um, alcohol, okay. emotional stress, environmental toxicities, hormone replacement therapy, all of these things have an impact uh, for, for good or for bad, depending on where, where on that scale you're choosing. Right. However, we have a long way to go. It's yeah. nutrition is hardly taught in medical schools. I didn't get one blip of it for one second ever. And then you go through, you have to realize, right? You go through all of high school, four years of college, four years of medical school. I did a five-year residency and a one-year fellowship. And now I'm finally 32 years old and out there in the real world get to do this craft that I've been honing and trying to, you know, sacrifice my whole life basically just to learn this. And now it's go time. I get to have my own practice and my own patients. And okay, if nutrition were so important, I should have heard a peep about it along the way somewhere, but I never did. So I'm not going home to crack open a journal to see if the sulforaphane in broccoli has the power to kill breast cancer because I don't think it does because no one ever told me about it. So I'm going to go home and have like an hour to my, <laughs> to exercise or do something else. And I'm going to go to bed and wake up and do my life again. So that's what happens. Doctors just get in a, in a rut. Um, they've learned what they've learned and now they're in practice mode. When I got my diagnosis, I was, I had gotten fat. I think largely because of the pandemic, I was exercising, but I think I was eating, I, I was eating nuts. I was eating a lot of nuts. Uh -huh. So I got fat and I, I, you know what? I keep telling people that I was, I had gotten so much fat here, mm. everywhere, but I noticed it here. And I was like, whose body is this? Mm -hmm. So I said to my primary care, you know, I, with this cancer diagnosis, it's kind of a reminder that I really need to get back in shape. And, you know, and she said, no, no, you're fine. I said, I really need to lose weight. I'm fat. I wasn't obese. I wasn't overweight according to my doctors or, you know, any of my care team. Like your body mass index was fine. Yeah. 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 That's what they were saying. And I was like, but I'm fat and I don't like the way I look. You know, I was looking bloated under here. I don't like the way I look. So I need to do something. And my primary care, who I, I, I adore, she's lovely, just lovely, so thorough. And she said, look at your bones. <laughs> and she said, you know, maximum, if you really feel like you need to lose 10 pounds. Well, since March, I've lost almost 25. Oh, um, wow. I'm feeling better than I have probably in my entire life. It's one of the silver linings that the cancer journey can bring to a person is it stimulates them to really max out on everything healthy that they know is yeah. true. Yeah. And if they embark on that path as you have, it can be transformative in a way that you almost have to be grateful that the cancer came because no other scary impetus could exist for certain people right. uh, to really just slap them into a 180 with certain behaviors. And so for that reason alone, there's sort of this before cancer, after cancer um, transformation that if you don't make it, you're missing out on the biggest lesson, I think, especially if cancer was curable for you and it didn't come here then to kill you. It totally failed, but it came here to change you. And so you want to be alert and attentive to that message that your your body is giving you. Yeah. It's also inspired, you know, people like mainly friends and people, you know, who watch my show, they're like, wow, you look great. What are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to tell you to get cancer. I'm going to tell you to try to <laughs> prevent it. So you right. can start from here instead of right. from here. Yeah, so, like when you see someone and you're like, oh my gosh, you look great. You lost so much weight. And she's like, yeah, I got divorced. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's probably not a good weight loss technique for most people. <laughs> but it does work. <laughs> If you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, please tap the subscribe button to help me keep this show going. And if you enjoyed this episode, like and share it because it really does help support me making this show, which helps people go vegan and stay vegan. Tap on notifications to be the first to know when a new episode or content drops. 
So on the last episode of this show of Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle, I shared some of the foods I eat and the and the and what I do to alleviate PMS or PMDD and menstrual symptoms, including taking vitamin D, which is, you know, I've been vegetarian since I was 12 and vegan since 1991. So only twice in my blood tests has anything come up lacking slightly. And it was the both times it was vitamin D. So mm. I've been taking that. And I just found out by looking at your website, Pink Lotus, that vitamin D is also linked to cancer. Yeah, it is. So research suggests that women who have low levels of vitamin D do have a higher risk of breast cancer, probably because vitamin D in its uh, normal quantities, which you want to get a blood test and have it be between 40 and 80 uh, nanograms per milliliter. So 40 to 80 is the ideal range. And when you're in that range, vitamin D is able to kind of control breast cell growth. So it doesn't get out of control and mutate and then proliferate into a cancer. So it might be that vitamin D actually can stop breast cancer cells from growing, but not when it's insufficient in quantity. It also is critical to helping the body absorb calcium. And besides calcium being linked to just good uh, bone health, it turns out that you need about 1250 milligrams of calcium a day to reduce breast cancer by 20 to 50%. And it's up to 74% for premenopausal women. So it probably works. The calcium probably works by decreasing um, fat induced cell proliferation and it neutralizes fatty acids and it binds these mutagenic bile acids so that you poop them out. Uh, and, and there was this one study that was so interesting. Um, I think it was Harvard. They, radio labeled um, bile acids and in women with breast cysts. And then they had them eat the acids down and then seven, eight, nine, something like that. So a few days later, like a week later, they aspirated the breast cysts and lo and behold, the radio labeled bile salts were in the breast cysts. So why this is important, um, it becomes interesting when you start looking at poop. So people who, have bowel movements less than once. Wait, what is it? Let me tell you exactly. Okay. So if you have a bowel movement um, one or more times a day versus someone who has two or fewer bowel movements a week, that you have four and a half times more breast cancer in the person who doesn't go number two often. And the reason is most likely what I just described. So when your poop has a long transit time through your colon and sits there long enough, your body has a bigger chance to absorb bile salts from the stool. And that's your body's way of the liver dumping out the bile salts to get rid of cholesterol. So it then reabsorbs it and it has a direct mutagenic cancer causing effect on the breast cells. So that Harvard study was so interesting because it showed that, yes, in fact, bile salts apparently know straight to know where to go straight to the breast to cause problems. So it's interesting. And it's another reason among many why maybe plant-based eaters have less breast cancer as a whole because they tend to be super poopers because they have more fiber and bulk and they poop more. The vitamin D is critical, as I said, to regulate breast cell turnover. And then when it's low, there's no like babysitter for the turnover to happen. So you want to probably be getting, it depends where you live. Once you're diagnosed with breast cancer, adequate vitamin D levels literally cut the death rate from breast cancer in half, according to studies. So you want to make sure you're getting that checked. Okay. People usually need a dietary dose of about 2000 IU a day. Um, and about 3000 comes from your skin. When you go outside without uh, sunscreen, you, the UV rays hit your skin and you produce vitamin D that way. But if you happen to live anywhere north of 40 degrees latitude, so for the US, that'd be like New York and above um, or south of 40 degrees latitude. So we're talking like Queenstown, Sydney, Cape Town, Buenos Aires. Um, if you do live in those areas, you probably need a vitamin D boost. So oftentimes you need to take 4,000 IU every day during the winter months when the sun doesn't shine. And like I said, get your blood level checked and it needs to be 40 to 80. Oftentimes my breast cancer patients need to be taking 50,000 IU 
a week to reach the levels they need. Yeah, that's what my um, that's what my primary care told me to take now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. It's amazing. And I, I had been sporadic with it. I'm like, your doctor told you, your doctor told you. I'm like, I'll take it. You know, I'm taking my probiotic. I'm taking my, you know, my my estrogen inhibiting medication. How much am I going to take? And then when I was, you know, preparing to talk with you, I read that and I was like, you were taking it. <laughs> <laughs> the vitamin cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there on the counter. Cannot mm-hmm. miss it and I will not miss it. Another thing talking about PMS and PMDD, menstruation and related during menopause, right? Women are confronted by the choice to have hormone replacement therapy, which can be a precursor to cancer. Hormone replacement therapy is basically prolonging your breast's exposure to cyclical hormonal levels. And studies have shown that it increases breast cancer to a different degree, depending on what type of hormone therapy you're taking. Now, in 2002, there was this huge, famous study called the Women's Health Initiative that had followed um, like 64,000 postmenopausal women who were on either PremPro, which is a man-made synthetic estrogen plus progesterone, actually comes from horse urine, uh, versus placebo. And they halted the study after 5.2 years as uh, for ethical reasons, because there was a clear 26% increase in breast cancer in those on the hormone replacement. But since that time, there have been other studies looking at estrogen only, and then you ask, what about bioidenticals? It becomes very multi-layered and complicated to really tease out what's true. But a more recent study in 2019 came out from the UK following 100,000 women. It wasn't long. It was, less, it was just uh, under five years follow-up. But what they found is that the women who were um, taking progest- estrogen plus progesterone, just like the big 2002 study, one in 50 got a breast cancer they would not have otherwise had. Mm -hmm. And if you were taking estrogen with intermittent progesterone, it was one in 70. And if you were taking estrogen alone, it was one in 200. In other words, it seems to be the addition of progesterone, which is a bigger driver toward breast cancer than estrogen alone. Mm -hmm. But when you extrapolate those numbers to an individual woman who's like, I am hot flashing my way to a divorce and can't remember my name half the time. So I don't care. Give me the hormone replacement. We do have to kind of do this risk benefit analysis on an individualized basis, because maybe you haven't tried acupuncture or really ramping up soy consumption, which has been proven to help with hot flashes. There are things you could try before you leap to something that's potentially dangerous. And then there's people such as yourself who have recently finished their main treatments for breast cancer, it would be especially risky for you and people in your situation to go on hormone replacement, but we also don't want you miserable. So there are a lot of things out there, complementary medicine wise that can help given which side effects we're trying to address, like mental acuity or is it hot flashes, what is happening? Okay. I've been kind of lucky, you know, I, I think when I first, I'm on tam- tamoxifen. Um, so when I first started, I was getting, you know, exhausted and a little bit kind of brain foggy uh, and it's all lifted now. Um, so I've been pretty lucky as far as that night sweats, I got like maybe three times. So I'm wondering if the plant-based diet has been helping to, to take care of, to take care of those side effects that, that, that other people have reported to, have at worse levels. Oh, it absolutely helps. There was a recent study out of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Neil Barnard's group, they looked at uh, menopause symptoms and soy intake and did a randomized controlled trial and showed that most definitely soy consumption uh, helps stave off some of those menopause symptoms. And actually in Japan, they don't even have a word for menopause. Like they sail through it, no big deal. And it's thought to possibly be from their higher consumption of soy. Amazing. Tofu, I always say tofu is my OG day one because the second my my parents, you know, I told, I announced that I was never eating animals again. My mother went to the local health food store and she's like, I came home from school and she showed me this white block from the fridge and she said, it's called tofu. And she put it on pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of looks like mozzarella, mom. But people do still have this kind of trepidation, right? They think, one, they think that all soy is genetically modified. And two, as you mentioned before, they hear phytoestrogen and they think estrogen. First of all, 
it is true that the majority of soy is GMO, genetically modified. It's dumped on with Roundup and you get glyphosate. Glyphosate is a potent estrogen mimicker in our bodies. And it's been dripped on Petri dishes of normal breast cells and turns them to cancer in three weeks. So glyphosate is not your friend, but it turns out that most of that soy is fed to animals and not to people. So it's not hard to go to the grocery store and find a non-GMO tofu, edamame, soy milk, um, tempeh miso, natto, you can find it easily in pretty much any uh, market that sells those products. Organic is better, but I'll take non-GMO. And if you can't find it, don't have it. Like that's how much I don't like the GMO soy. Okay. So now let's move on though to the bigger question of what about these phytoestrogens? So again, confessions from an author here <laughs> and a breast cancer surgeon who told women such as yourself, to spit that miso out of your mouth. What do you think you're doing? That's a phytoestrogen. It's, it, do you think that this cancer that was fed and fueled by estrogen cares where it came from? No, you can't have soy. Forget it. Pick almond milk. All right. Well, I we went into the literature again while writing my book. But guess what? I was going to pull the papers that proved what I was saying for all those nearly two decades. And I was ho horrified to find out that not only is soy okay to eat, I want you to consume it. It's a breast superfood. So what was happening? A couple of things. Number one, there are two receptors for estrogen in our bodies. The receptor on cancer is alpha. And with 1600% more um, uh, affinity, the phytoestrogens like genistein and daidzein and soy hit beta. All right. So once it hits beta, it activates it. And beta does two very interesting things. One, it shuts alpha down. So it's actually kind of acting like tamoxifen and stopping estrogen's ability to bind. And it goes out into your fat cells and shuts off an enzyme called aromatase, mm -hmm. which is busy converting precursor steroids from your adrenal gland like testosterone, androstenedione. Aromatase turns those into estrogen and soy shuts the aromatase down. So you're making less estrogen. Wow. Now, Enter 2009 and beyond, there, the human studies on soy have poured into existence, and there isn't a single one that shows that soy is linked to breast cancer, except to say it decreases it. Every study, on average, drops cancer occurrence, recurrence, and death by around 32%. Some more, some a little less, but that number 32 is like echoing throughout the literature. It's it's always 32. I don't know why, um, but I have a solid... Um, like 12 studies in women looking at breast cancer that have already had breast cancer, you know, cause you worry, you're like, well, maybe I'm right. And it's okay if you don't have cancer, but once I have cancer, I should probably play it safe. Right. And it's not true. You're being unsafe if you don't consume soy because all the human data shows that it drops recurrence and death between 30 and 60% for high versus low soy consumers. So I do like people that have two to three servings of soy a day. And one of the most powerful ways to consume it, I might, say is my antioxidant smoothie every single ingredient in there has evidence and science behind it to show that it contains nutrients and chemicals in the plant foods that neutralize cancer that take away what it needs to grow and persist inside your body so this smoothie is like a nutrient bomb for any Ooh. cancer patient. oh i'm gonna have to make this i'm gonna make it and post it to my my social oh. media so we can share with everybody. Awesome. I would love that. Now I love my smoothies and I will, oh, I can't, I'm so excited to try this. <laughs> yeah. Another thing um, off the vegan path that is my latest obsession, it's a huge stride in precision medicine. So we're starting to understand that, you know, people are unique. Everyone's different. And when you tell someone, for example, oh, you have a 30% chance of your breast cancer coming back if you don't do chemotherapy. And then 30 will become around 12 if you do the chemo. 70% hmm. of the people that we say that to never needed the chemo, right? It was never coming back. So can't we figure out who is who? And until recently, the answer was kind of like, no, we just go with our gut on that one. Mm -hmm. So Signaterra is a new blood test that Medicare approved for the monitoring of colorectal cancer in October, 2020, and we're expecting breast approval in December, 2022, but it's relevant for all solid tumors. So colon, lung, liver, breast, prostate, on and on. They make a blood test out of 16 mutations that belong to your cancer. Then they come to your house, draw your blood and run it through the test. 
if you're cured, you should never have any of those 16 cancer mutations flying around your bloodstream, right? Trying to recur. So I test my breast patients every three months. And when they hit the two year mark of negatives, their bre the company's breast data show was a less than 3% chance that they will ever recur. Yeah. And then if a test should turn positive, it happens nine and a half months before a PET CT lights up or symptoms like bone pain show up or a tumor marker like CEA rises up. So you can intervene and hopefully stave off that definite impending recurrence. Uh -huh. So it's a really powerful way to monitor for recurrence for people out there with active disease stage four or just pursuing something else right now. I check them every month to make sure the levels are going down because if they turn upwards, we have to change the strategy. And then finally, as I was alluding to for that person who's like, well, my cancer's out. Do I really need the chemo? If there are no cells from that cancer in your blood, what's the chemo killing? It's all collateral damage at that point. Mm -hmm. So we can monitor you monthly. And if it should ever turn positive, maybe that's the time to start the chemo. Oh, this is all so good to know. You know, when I, when I was diagnosed, everything happened so fast that usually if it was some, if it was anyone else, I would have been like researching and looking and whatever, but I'm looking, I'm learning stuff now, which is fine. Again, I lucked out and I'm still right. I, I still have a job to do for the rest of my life to make sure that I'm healthy and, and take care of myself. So it doesn't come back, but also now loving having my show so that I can help people and, and bring your knowledge to them as well. Okay. So let's get to the question that people who know you will know that you are the surgeon behind the, the surgeries of many people, but including famously Angelina Jolie and Sheryl Crow, the latter of whose diagnosis Sheryl Crow's was, seems very similar to mine and her and treatment. But Angelina Jolie's garnered a lot of worldwide attention. Can you explain the differences between their two diagnoses and treatments? Right. So Cheryl was diagnosed with an early stage invasive breast cancer that was treated with the typical uh, surgery, radiation, the choice of anti-estrogens, and she didn't luckily need chemo. So very similar to you. And in general, those subtypes of cancer have excellent outcomes uh, doing just that kind of intervention. You don't need to get aggressive with a mastectomy. And one thing that people um, don't tend to know ever, unless they have breast cancer, and then hopefully they do understand it. But there was a study that asked women who chose mastectomy, why? And 98% of them said either to live longer or so that the cancer doesn't come back, which is a little tragic to me because neither of those is true. So lumpectomy followed by radiation versus taking your whole breast off identical recurrence, identical survival. So either their doctors weren't very clear in that when they were making a decision or they weren't listening because they were too traumatized by the diagnosis, but there was miscommunication there. And that upsets me because like the majority of women who choose mastectomy apparently think they're extending their lifespan and they are not. Yeah. So the people who choose mastectomy anyway, when they have a breast cancer are either gene mutation carriers. So BRCA1 check to other things that predispose them to make yet another breast cancer, or they have a big tumor in a small breast. So it's a cosmetic tipping point to remove the lumpectomy just leaves them with not a breast shape. So it looks prettier to do mastectomy, or they really don't want that radiation that makes it an equal choice with mastectomy. So if they want to avoid radiation and get down to a nice low recurrence number, they might choose mastectomy for that reason. And then the final main reason for which I do mastectomies is that women who choose mastectomy just want it. And they can have a myriad of reasons. They could have a family tree just littered with breast cancer, even though there's no known mutation. They themselves could be only 30 years old and a lifelong vegan. And like, what else can I do to stave off a recurrence? Like I'm just feeling too risky at this point. Others don't want to show up there. They have an anxious personality. They're like, there's no way I want mammograms and ultrasounds and MRIs and biopsies. Like just take them. They're trying to kill me. I don't want them. So there are reasons for mastectomy, but the one that pertains to Angelina Jolie is that she found out that she had a gene mutation, BRCA1, mm -hmm. that carries a very, very high risk, up to 87% lifetime chance of breast cancer, 44% chance of ovarian cancer. So the decision to remove an organ that's at incredibly high risk to develop cancer and potentially take your life. Um, before it actually makes that cancer is called prophylactic. So she had prophylactic.
prophylactic mastectomies as a way to take her astronomically high risk to basically zero. All right. All right. Thank you for explaining that. And okay, so let's let's get to the magic question. <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> your smoothie. And I know you have a lot of tips in your book, which uh, viewers should absolutely get. And I cannot wait to read it myself. What are the magic foods, superfoods and just plain old vegetables and fruits that mm -hmm. we should be consuming and even other vegan or lifestyle related things we should be doing um, for those of us in remission or recovery to care for ourselves and to avoid risk and recurrence? Oh, there's so much you can do. So this is a great <laughs> question. And the answer should excite and delight you because there is power in your food and your choices, like we keep saying. The main um, superfoods that have been proven in the science to annihilate cancer and help stop her recurrence are going to be cruciferous vegetables. So, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, um, kale, arugula, bok choy, collards, all of these are in the cruciferous family, but king of them all is the broccoli sprout. Um, and then second in line would be broccoli. And the reason is sulforaphane. So these compounds form um, once you chew, you break open the cell components and an isothiocyanate comes in contact with this enzyme called myrosinase and whoo, out of nowhere comes sulforaphane, which is this like green caped superhero that has the power to <laughs> seek out and destroy not just any cancer cell. There was a recent study that um, showed that breast cancer stem cells. So these are like the little masterminds of recurrence and death because they evade getting killed off by chemo and can thwart most of the things we throw at them. Stem cells were killed off by the amount of sulforaphane you would get from eating a cup and a quarter of broccoli sprouts daily, which is a big handful, I have to say. But if I had an active breast cancer stage four, or it's still in you, I would definitely be growing those sprouts or buying them in the store. So cruciferous veggies are numero uno. Two is soy. We already talked about why. So you definitely want to be getting your organic soy in daily. And the third superfood. So I get these three in my body every day without fail. It's a half cup of raw broccoli, uh, two tablespoons of ground flax seeds, <laughs> and two to three servings of soy in some form. Mm -hmm. Flax seeds have um, lignans, which are another phytoestrogen. And this time the lignans have been shown in humans with breast cancer to decrease the division rate on cancer cells called the KI-67. It slows the division rate by 34% and increases apoptosis, which is cancer cell suicide, your body's saying it's time for you to just implode. And so it does. So flax is a powerhouse. What's that? I love it. Like I guess I'm look, looking at it like a video game, like boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Take that in. answer. Um, and then a super ingredient is fiber. So think whole grains, beans, veggies, fruits, berries, packed with fiber. Fiber is so much more than just about bowel movements, but as we already discussed, it can be about bowel movements and more or better, unless it's excessively crazy, but um, <laughs> The fiber keeps you regular. It also is the prebiotic for your gut microbiota. And they release a litany of antioxidants and vitamins and short chain fatty acids, which have incredible anti-inflammatory ability. So there's a lot to eating fiber. I want to see a minimum of 30 grams a day. More is better. Um, berries, I mentioned as a fiber source, but in and of themselves, they have ellagic acid um, and other polyphenols that can uh, create um, apoptosis, but also they're anti-angiogenic. So when we talked about the blood vessels coming to tumors, berries are very uh, anti-angiogenic and extinguish that oxidative damage as well. So that's one. Apples have been ex examined and it turns out that an apple a day does in fact keep breast cancer away by about 24% for daily apple eaters. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the red apple seems to have the most um, anthocyanidins that decrease breast cancer, at least in Petri dishes, dripped on breast cancer cells. The peel has all of the power, much more so than the flesh of the apple. So never juice apples and drink juice. That's just going to spike your blood sugar, spiking your insulin. We talked about that whole process. But smoothies, so blended or whole, are the way to go. Um, for yummy. Yeah. <laughs> All these delicious <laughs> ways, like, you know, it's, um, yeah, 
delicious. So this is all so exciting. All so exciting. Sorry, I didn't, know, I didn't want to interrupt you. I'm just so excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I can go on. I have a um, through PCRM with Chuck Carroll, you know, the weight loss champion. He and I did a podcast uh, recently looking at the um, top 18 anti-cancer breast superfoods. So I can go on and on. That was just 18. I still have more at my sleep. <laughs> but one little known one is not a fruit or a vegetable. It's a fungus. So mushrooms. We have a 20... 21 study that was a meta-analysis of 17 different um, mushroom studies looking at high versus low consumers, mm -hmm. finding an average 35% drop in a breast cancer occurrence and recurrence for those who eat mushrooms. So shrooms are definitely high on the superfood list. Yeah. Then we've got things that are just add add-ins right like the whole um allium family garlic onions leeks shallots chives scallions you want to eat those raw you can saute or cook them but then always chop up some raw and throw it back in it has to do with the enzyme alienase uh getting destroyed by heat in cooking as does the myrosinase in the broccoli story okay so whenever you eat roasted broccoli you are not getting the sulforaphane it's gone it, it, the enzyme got destroyed so you always want to be adding in some raw chopped cruciferous like whether it's more arugula on there or chopped raw broccoli which is what I do and my kids are always like mom you have to make everything so healthy I'm like what's the point of eating the roasted broccoli if you don't have my roasted um <laughs> spices turmeric uh it's kind of king of them all the curcumin in there is made two thousand percent more bioavailable by adding the piperine in pepper which uh, black pepper, which in its own right has anti-cancer properties. So turmeric and black pepper always go together with a fat because it's fat soluble. So in my smoothie, we have that turmeric, black pepper, and the flax, which has some fat. Obviously, it's the highest, um, most concentrated source of omega-3 healthy fatty acids on the planet. So soy is just, I mean, flax is just a miracle worker. And soy also has a little bit of fat. So that is the base of the smoothie. So I have a question because, you know, one can Google trying to be her own researcher, but it's never as good as, you know, a proper, a true scientist and doctor. I have read that because I'm taking tamoxifen, tamoxifen there are certain things to avoid, such as pomegranate, chamomile tea. Grapefruit. Grapefruit. The peel of mandarin oranges, which I have actually cooked with. Oh. Um, and turmeric, which was so upsetting to me because it's an anti-inflammatory and has all the benefits you just mentioned. So I've been avoiding it since starting on tamoxifen. tamoxifen. What is your thinking on that? I just researched this um, again the other day because it came up and I wanted to be sure nothing had changed. Uh -huh. I think you really have to be consuming super physiologic doses of turmeric, mm -hmm. the kind that you find in supplements and capsules, right? They find out that curcumin can kill cancer cells. So they put it into a capsule and they sell it to you for 30 bucks and you consume an amount that you never would have had on your rice bowl or in the smoothie. So okay. a quarter teaspoon a day is going to give you benefit and not interfere with the metabolism of your tamoxifen. Okay. So I'm going to ask the friend that I gave my huge bag to, to give it back yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to my turmeric bag. Give me my turmeric. <laughs> All right, that I'm so happy to hear that because I love it. I put it right in my tofu scramble. I put it in so much that um, okay, and now I want to make this the full the full Dr. Dr. Funk smoothie. So that's great. To, <laughs> great to know. <laughs> All right. So speaking of tamoxifen, I this I guess the, this will be my final question. What about medications? Can we avoid them on a healthy plant-based diet? It depends on the subtype of your cancer and certain factors. So for you, they probably ran something called Oncotype. Yeah. Did you get that test? Yeah. So depending on the risk of recurrence, I think it might be dangerous to go totally food-oriented with your risk reduction. Also in someone like you who was so healthy to begin with, the huge strides you can make are maybe more minimal compared to someone else who has a ton to change about her diet and lifestyle. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's that test that we discussed that you can see the whole FAQ at tumordna.com. Really, you could get Signaterra every three months. And if there are no cancer cells in your bloodstream, the tamoxifen at that point isn't stopping a recurrence because there isn't one coming. 
It is, however, helping reduce future cancer occurrence, like a whole new one in either breast by 50%, which is a percent you might deem worth taking the tamoxifen for. I do think that food um, is, is incomplete when it comes to risk reduction, partly because it's hard to stay the course. Like every single day, you're gonna drink my smoothie every day and make sure you get the flax and the soil. Like it's hard, but a pill, swallowed it, boom, yeah, I'm protected today. So there is something a little emancipating about that. Like you don't have to be so rigid with the with the eating and remembering every day to hit all of these like answers. It's actually like, easier for me to have a smoothie than it is to remember to take a pill. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. 50, reports say 50% of women are not um, compliant with their daily anti-estrogen medicine. So oh, wow. you're in good company. I've, yeah, I've been taking it. I've been taking it, but I'm like, I have to make sure to put it there. My smoothie, fine, because I'm it's yummy, and I'm gonna. Have, I'm like right. oh, smoothie. The pill, I'm like, I don't want that. <laughs> but I do. I've been a good. I've been good. I've been very good. So all right. Yeah, I think like one um, study that kind of can help understand that there might be a difference. There was a when looking at all that human data in the soy. Uh, analysis that I was alluding to. There was one that followed 2000 women, survivors on tamoxifen, they were followed for over six years average, and they had a 60% drop in recurrence. Okay, so this was high soy consumers on tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. Then I have another study with 6200 multi ethnic survivors followed for 9.4 years. And there was a 32% drop in mortality for women with estrogen driven tumors, not taking tamoxifen. Wow. So high soy consumption can drop recurrence and death by about 32%, there's that number. Um, but taking it with soy plus tamoxifen was 60%. Yeah. We need larger and more studies to prove the point repeatedly to really hang your hat on that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a good example of how yes, food makes a huge, huge impact on outcome. But food plus the medication can make an even bigger one in certain individuals. Right. I love hearing that. Is there any other final message you'd like to leave viewers with before we before we sign off? Yes, I would like all of your viewers to know uh, that I've collaborated yet again with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine to bring you the Let's Beat Breast Cancer dot org challenge so if you go to let's be breast .org, we're like super active in the month of october but it's always active because you have breasts all year long so you can join any time and when you sign up you automatically get weekly newsletters and a free e-cookbook and now in october we have fun giveaways even like a vitamix and every thursday in october i do live zooms with a special guest to help people um, initiate and stick to a four-pronged approach to beating breast cancer. So you're going to sign up and say, yes, I'm willing to take the challenge. And the challenge is that you will follow a whole food plant-based diet, exercise regularly, maintain an ideal body weight, and minimize alcohol, all in the name of decreasing breast cancer risk and maximizing health. And we kind of come alongside you and do it together as a fun family. So it's really cool. Okay. Other parting gift I'd like to leave everyone that is also completely free is my online community. You'll find them at pinklotus.com slash power up. Power up is a huge online community of women who are just so excited to meet and greet you. And within there, if you just rummage around, you'll see my cancer kicking kitchen with recipes. I do live cook uh, demos once a month. And those are really fun. I spotlight vegan ingredients and why they matter so much inside your body. And we have local chapters. There are 25 throughout the country in major cities. And these local chapters get together to hike, walk, run, cook, camp. And I even have a five-day fast coming up oh. that we will uh, meet at night on Zoom to be miserable together, all in the name of longevity. <laughs> and um, another thing you may love, Lucia, is uh, breast buddies. So this is something very near and dear to my heart. I don't know if you ever read or heard that about the LACE study, Life After Cancer Epidemiology Study, followed 2,200 early stage breast cancer patients for 10.2 years, and they found a 58% bump in mortality for those who reported low levels of psychosocial support. So to me, it's so important. Not everybody has a BFF. So what I everyone can have is breast buddy, and this is another totally free thing. And you go in as someone newly diagnosed, and you put in your stats, like your age, your stage, your treatment plan, and like Match.com for breasts, uh -huh. up pops someone 
that matches you age for age, stage for stage, treatment for treatment. And she is there because she's been there, done that, and wants you to contact her so she can be a source of friendship and support as you embark on your journey that she just went through. It is so powerful. I have seen lifelong friendships. People go on vacations around the world together, having met through Breast Buddies. So I encourage everyone, it's completely free. So explore Power Up and um, find your tribe. Oh, I love it. That is beautiful. Thank you, doctor, for everything you're offering to people to get through this. And um, and thanks again Thank so you. much for, for, for coming and for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me and congratulations on successfully navigating your breast cancer journey. Tune in to forthcoming episodes of Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle on MNN, Tuesdays at 8.30 p.m. bi-weekly. Subscribe to the Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle YouTube channel, follow across social media, and follow and shop on Amazon Live and the curated LVL Amazon storefront. Purchase a copy of Dr. Christy Funk's book, Breasts, The Owner's Manual, Every Woman's Guide to Reducing Cancer Risk, Making Treatment Choices, and Optimizing Outcomes via the link in the episode description below and in the LVL Amazon storefront. For details and to purchase products I used during cancer treatment, recovery, and to prevent recurrence, join me on the Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle Amazon Live. Purchase some of the products right now via the links in this episode description below and in the curated LVL Amazon storefront breast cancer list. I hope you found this episode insightful and helpful. If you did, be sure to like and comment below and share the link with others. Level up with LVL and live your best vegan life. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Lucia's Vegan Lifestyle, your show for compassionate living without sacrifice. I'm Lucia, I'm vegan, and this is my lifestyle.